So, good afternoon. We move on to looking at reinforced masonry design and today I will give you an overview of the reinforced masonry code before we go into specific aspects particularly the um, PM axial force bending moment design, uh, we are looking at the interaction and uh, shear design of walls. So, uh, we begin by getting an overview of what the national building codes uh, recommendations are with respect to reinforced masonry. So, that is what um, we are going to be looking at today, the guidelines for reinforced masonry itself. So, we are specifically referring to part 6 section 4 of uh, the code which is available in volume 1 of NBC. So, this deals with reinforced walls both load bearing and uh, non load bearing walls, but we are as I said working with the permissible stress uh, design and um, this code is applicable to all types of um, materials, all types of units particularly the solid units with cavity walls so that reinforcement can be placed or perforated walls or hollow, uh, hollow brick walls. So, um, across the spectrum of materials. Uh, this code regulates the use of different materials and different types of units for reinforced masonry design itself. There are few words uh, which are specific to reinforced masonry which the code has introduced and therefore, I am um, just touching upon uh, some of these which uh, we it is better we use it specific to how the code uh, examines these words. When we talk of joint reinforcement, uh, we are talking of the horizontal bed joint and these are typically prefabricated uh, joint reinforcement. We have seen the example that I gave you, a lattice type um, with a truss type or a uh, ladder type. So, this is typically the joint reinforcement with reference to the bed joint of the wall, masonry wall itself. Uh, when we are talking of grouted cavity reinforcement, we are really talking of cavity walls, you have a solid um, single leaf, two solid single leaves which are then connected by ties appropriately designed to keep them together and in the cavity you have the horizontal and vertical reinforcement which is placed. So, when we talk of grouted cavity reinforced masonry, it is really the cavity wall construction where reinforcement is placed in the cavity whereas, the wall itself is constructed using solid units. The category that we have been looking at um, earlier in the different typology of masonry where the hollow blocks are reinforced is referred to as pocket type reinforced masonry. That is the reinforcement is placed within the uh, pockets that are available within each unit. So, it is referred to as pocket type reinforcement, pocket type reinforced masonry where you then have to do in situ concreting in within the pocket. In the previous category, the cavity wall, the entire cavity has to be uh, grouted with concrete uh, in situ. Quetta bond is the other type that we had seen and this is typically when you have one and a half um, unit construction. The, the <laughs> thickness of the wall is one and a half units. So, um, the arrangement you have seen earlier in our um, second module that you leave vertical pockets and reinforcement runs through these pockets and this also requires in situ concreting um, to hold the reinforcement in place. Um, when the word specified compressive strength of masonry is used, it is uh, referring to the minimum compressive strength that the uh, unit or the concrete must have. So, the word specified compressive strength of masonry is with reference to minimum compressive strength. Okay. With that, uh, it is not exhaustive, but these are words that uh, we have not used earlier. There are specific requirements on the materials that have to be used. There are limits on the materials that you can use as far as design of reinforced masonry is concerned. Um, the constituents again, first one is the masonry unit. You require that the masonry unit, the code requires that the masonry unit has a minimum strength of 7 mega Pascals, right. So, if you remember the, um, the earlier table that we were referring to, uh, 
the strength of masonry units go uh, as prescribed by the code can go all the way from 3.5 MPA class 3.5 all the way up to 35 and 40. However, when you are going to be reinforcing masonry, you need to have a minimum compressive strength of 7 MPA and this comes from the requirement that once you reinforce a uh, masonry wall, the stiffness of the masonry wall is increased the shear demand particularly for seismic design um, is concerned the shear demand that can come to the wall actually increases but when you have large shear demand in a masonry wall which has low compressive strength of unit you can have crushing failure of the masonry units which is a brittle failure mechanism the steel will not be the masonry units will not resist until the steel goes into yielding to ensure ductile behavior of the wall. You will, have a you will have a compression failure which is a brittle failure mechanism which is to be avoided and hence a minimum strength is required for masonry uh, construction with reinforcement. And of course with uh, clay bricks you will have a challenge of getting 7 MPA depending on the region where you are getting bricks from. But if you are looking at hollow construction, hollow block construction, uh, it is quite uh, easy to get strengths that are of the order of 10, 12 uh, or 15 MPA and higher. So um, this is an important requirement. So low strength units should not be used for reinforced masonry uh, at all. As far as concrete is concerned, the concrete shall at least be M20 grade concrete and this is particularly where you are placing reinforcement and this comes um, primarily from the durability requirements that protection to the reinforcement is required uh, from corrosion. So M20 grade of concrete and as far as the steel is concerned, you have to have a minimum cover of 15 mm at the top and bottom and 20 millimeters cover on the sides. So this requirement should dictate the number of bars you will actually be able to place within a given pocket itself uh, and choice of bar diameter. So we are talking of wherever you are placing reinforcement in a groove, ensure that at the top and the bottom, if it is horizontally placed, you have 15 mm at the top and the bottom, whereas 20 mm on the sides in the cross section uh, as cover provided by concrete to the steel reinforcement. This is far lesser than what is prescribed as minimum cover for uh, reinforced concrete construction, primarily because we are already placing it within the unit. The st steel reinforcement is, is placed in the pocket inside the unit and then you are talking of the cover that the concrete in the pocket is providing to the steel. So it is already protected but this is the second layer of protection. However, the, the units typically are porous and therefore there is a requirement that the concrete protects the steel reinforcement. If you are placing uh, joint reinforcement, you do not have concrete in the joint, you have just mortar in the joint and you have to use high strength motors. You are not allowed to use uh, weak motors and this is primarily from the point of view of durability. Higher the strength of motor, lower will be the porosity and therefore high strength motors category H1 and H2 shall be used if you are using bed joint reinforcement, joint reinforcement itself. And as far as steel reinforcement is concerned, you are required to use steel reinforcement FE415 or lesser. Now that is challenging. Uh, you do not want high strength steels because higher the strength, uh, more is the, the demand that is going to go on to the uh, masonry, the masonry part uh, before the steel can yield and that can imply crushing failure uh, before the steel yields. So you do not want a brittle mechanism, so you are keeping the steel reinforcement um, limited to 415 or FE415 or lesser. So uh, it is important to have compatibility between the strengths that you are um, examining in the composite material and it, this requirement comes from a compatibility point of view such that um, yielding in the bar is, uh, is allowed for. And of course, uh, you cannot use rounded bars, you have to use deformed bars for construction. Now um, wherever there is a requirement uh, from the design perspective for seismic resistance, for earthquake resistance or um, need to transmit horizontal forces, 
even wind forces, you must ensure that the steel reinforcement coming from the wall is adequately anchored to the floor or the roof diaphragms. The uh, detailing has to be done such that the steel reinforcement from the walls is adequately anchored uh, to the uh, floor diaphragms or the roof diaphragms and should be able to, so enough development length is essential so that transfer of forces between the horizontal elements and the vertical elements uh, is provided for, is allowed for by the construction itself. A little bit of discussion on effective spans because you are going to be looking at uh, reinforced concrete, reinforced masonry beams, reinforced masonry walls and so what effective spans, um, what is the definition of effective span as far as um, these structural members are concerned and should you be looking at different um, effective spans given the type of boundary conditions and given the type of member you are looking at. So if you are looking at a simply supported member or a continuous member, um, a beam or a wall, you use the smaller of the distance between the supports or the clear distance, a clear span between the supports plus an effective depth D of the section itself. However, if you are looking at a cantilever, you can look at the distance between the end of the cantilever and the center of the support or the distance between the end of the cantilever and the face of the support plus half the effective depth whichever is greater. So these are typical requirements which you see even in reinforced concrete but when you are making an effective span calculations you have to be uh, sure about what uh, type of member you are looking at and what the boundary conditions are. Again when you are estimating the slenderness ratios uh, with respect to walls, when you are looking at the ratio of effective height to the effective thickness of the wall, for walls, reinforced masonry walls, when they are vertically loaded in their plane, we are talking of a maximum slenderness ratio of 27. So that is a number uh, you want to keep in mind, the slenderness ratio uh, of the wall for vertical load carrying capacity is limited to 27. However, if you are looking at designing columns, this number is limited to 20. So um, 27 for walls and 20 for columns. However, all designs of columns must consider a minimum eccentricity of 10 percent of the side dimensions. So um, that is minimum eccentricity in the um, reinforced masonry, reinforced concrete code is 5 percent of the side dimensions. You are looking at 10 percent of the side dimension and that has got to do with um, workmanship because of the building up of the wall with blocks which can lead to additional eccentricities uh, as against concrete construction which can have lesser problems uh, due to the workmanship itself. Um, if you are looking at a wall that is subjected to out of plane bending, so if you are looking at a uh, the first one that we looked at with a limiting value of 27 for the slenderness ratio was for a vertically loaded wall. But if you are looking at a wall which is designed for bending to resist lateral forces or if you are looking at a beam which is um, sitting in a wall and is subjected to bending in the plane of the wall, then you have to use um, the uh, limits on the effective span, the maximum effective span to effective depth ratio as prescribed by this, uh, by this table and you can see that depending on the boundary conditions that you are looking at, you can see that when a wall is being considered for out of plane bending, depending on the boundary conditions simply supported to continuous to bending in two directions, we are accounting for higher slenderness uh, ratios or higher maximum effective span to effective depth that you can consider for this sort of a wall. Uh, whereas for beams for in plane bending, the values are comparable to what we have been using for um, the wall under vertical loads itself. And again, different boundary conditions simply supported continuous diagonal bending, two directions spanning and cantilevered uh, walls or cantilevered beams uh, in a wall. The, there are a set of requirements that you have as far as reinforcement detailing is concerned because one of the fundamental reasons. Uh, because of which reinforced masonry is not very popular, particularly in tropical regions where there is moisture, there is heavy rainfall, humidity levels are high, is the problem of corrosion. So it is very important that the um, workmanship 
and the materials used do not compromise the uh, durability of these systems and so there are specific requirements as far as reinforcement and detailing of reinforcement is concerned and we look at few of them here. We are using the working stress approach to uh, design these walls and so uh, when you are going to be working on the cross sections, we will basically use a transform section approach and I, uh, I believe all of you will be familiar with the transform section approach um, although both the codes IS456 and uh, IS800 for concrete and steel do not use any longer a um, working stress approach but you will have to calculate the transformed areas using modular ratio where the actual area uh, of the cross section which is resisting compression which is the masonry area of the brick portion or the area of the unit plus the transformed area where AS is the area of cross section um, of the steel and M is the modular ratio between steel uh, and concrete steel and concrete or steel and masonry um, modulus of elasticity. So transform section approach has to be used for your design calculations and uh, since we are working within the uh, permissible stresses approach your stiffness calculations have to be to be consistent with the um, limits that we assume for the working stress stiffness calculations have to be based on uncracked stiffness you should not be using crack stiffness for estimating the flexural stiffness or the, or the stiffness of the walls. In terms of allowable stresses as far as um, the steel is concerned we are talking of depending on the bar diameter depending on the type of bar that you are using specifications of what should be the allowable stress mild steel bars of diameters up to 20 millimeters and mild steel bars beyond 20 millimeter diameter with 140 and 130 MPA um, allowable stress and if you are using high strength high yield strength um, deformed bars 230 MPA or you use 0.5 FY if you are using FE 500 uh, steel for your con uh, construction of reinforced masonry. If you are looking at compressive stresses because the, the, the bars can be the reinforcement bars can be accounted for their um, additional contribution to resisting compression and if you are using mild steel bars you use a compressive stress of 130 MPA as the um, allowable stress and for HYST bars as 190 MPA. So these are prescriptions from standard um, literature on and foreign codes as well on uh, working stress approach to uh, masonry design. Okay, minimum requirements as far as the size of reinforcement is concerned and spacing of reinforcement is concerned. The maximum size of reinforcement bars that is permitted is 25, M, uh, 25 millimeters diameter bars uh, because you typically uh, are working with embedding this inside wall cross sections and the wall cross sections are limited by unit sizes. So 25 mm bars are what are prescribed as maximum size of reinforcement, minimum size of reinforcement should not be less than 8 millimeters. Spacing of reinforcement bars, you will you'll need to look at the clear distance between parallel bars and the clear distance between parallel bars should not be less than the diameter of the bars or, um, or 25 millimeters and this is really coming from the requirement of the um, core segregates which should be able to uh, fill in and not provide not, uh, not result in honeycombing uh, as you are as you're grouting the pockets with the um, steel reinforcement. And if you are looking at the bar the spacing between reinforcement in while designing columns and pilasters the clear distance between vertical bars is not to be less than 1.5 times the bar diameter nor less than 35 mm. So you can make that calculation but these requirements have to be have to be followed. <coughs> Again development length we have been talking about um, the requirement of continuity of steel reinforcement between the horizontal diaphragms and the walls. So development length can be estimated as 0.25 into the diameter of the bar into the permissible stress of the steel FS, FS is the permissible tensile stress of the steel um, but this cannot be less than 300 mm. So minimum 300 mm development length has to be provided or LD as estimated and you can provide standard hooks uh, 
uh, which can take care of the anchorage if you are not able to provide sufficient development length and as we do curtailment of flexural reinforcement as in, um, in reinforced concrete design in beams, you can also do curtailment of um, flexural reinforcement in zones where the moment demand is lesser than the maximum uh, demand. Lap splicing is again something that you will have to take care of because reinforcement is going to go in the vertical direction all the way uh, through the load bearing walls. So lap splicing provisions also have to be accounted for. As far as uh, issues of bond and corrosion protection um, of the steel are concerned, it is these reinforcing bars are embedded in, the, uh, in these cavities and a minimum clear cover of 10 millimeters in the mortar or a minimum clear cover of 15 millimeters or the bar diameter whichever is more in the grout has to be provided and if you are placing reinforcement in the mortar bed joint, you have to ensure that the minimum distance that you have, if you are looking at the cross section, the minimum distance that you have between the edge of the reinforcement and the face of the masonry is not less than 15 millimeters. So when you are measuring laterally along a cross section between the face of the masonry and the reinforcement, uh, there must be at least 15 millimeters of, um, of mortar. Above and below the mortar joint, uh, you should at least have 2 millimeters of, uh, of material and today uh, we have high strength mortars which are thin high strength mortars. So uh, you can actually minimize the bed joint thickness if you are going with flat truss type or flat lattice type bed joint reinforcement such that you do not increase the bed joint thickness because you know that higher the bed joint thickness lower is the strength of masonry it, such that you do not compromise with the strength of masonry. You can use high strength uh, mortars in the, um, in the joint and you bring down this uh, cover to almost 2 millimeters for bed joint reinforcement. For corrosion resistance, it is, it is prescribed that you can go for stainless steel, but of course stainless steel would imply uh, shooting up of prices, uh, the cost of construction, at least galvanized hot tip galvanized or epoxy coated steel reinforcement has to be used to uh, ensure there is protection against reinforcement, like, um, but you could also have uh, bars which are regular bars, the um, uh, steel bars, but they are coated with uh, a layer of austenitic uh, stainless steel to provide uh, pro corrosion protection. So uh, the fact that the code is dedicating a section specifically on what provisions you, you must take care of corrosion protection is simply because of this problem being able to defeat the whole purpose of um, the typology reinforced masonry, particularly in tropical or high humidity climates. Some uh, specific guidelines as far as the um, structural design is concerned, we will, we will be going and examining each uh, design uh, in detail, but what you are going to see in the next few slides is um, overall requirements as far as uh, the structural design is concerned. So if you are looking at members that are subjected to flexure and axial forces, we would be looking at uh, treating PM interactions for reinforced masonry walls uh, in detail, but the code requires that if the axial stress levels in a wall that uh, has both flexure bending effects and um, axial forces due to gravity, if the axial stress is less than 10 percent of the compressive strength of the material, you can treat the wall as a pure bending design, meaning that you are really not, uh, you are really not uh, depending on the beneficial effect of compression in the, in the wall. So you are looking at a uh, design for bending only if the axial stress level is less than 10 percent of the um, axial stress uh, of the compressive strength of the material masonry. And whenever there is um, continuity of the wall, that the continuous ends where you have tension reinforcement at the supports, uh, there is a requirement for continuing the tension reinforcement across the support. So at least 50 percent of the tension steel that is required at the mid span and at least 25 percent of that should be carried through the support and anchored um, effectively into either the return walls or um, the slabs uh, 
whatever be the boundary. When you are looking at columns, the minimum percentage of steel that you must consider for uh, reinforced masonry columns is 0.25 percent or 0.25 uh, percent of the net area, but not less than 4 bars. So, the minimum number of bars that you should provide in a uh, reinforced masonry column is 4 bars, uh, mi minimum percentage being 0.25 percent. However, the maximum percentage of steel that you can provide is 4 percent and that is really on the higher side, uh, you would not be providing anywhere close to that for uh, structures which are two or three storied reinforced masonry structures. Lateral ties have to be provided within columns, so your cavities must be sufficient enough to be able to provide lateral ties. These ties should have a diameter of at least 6 millimeters and with a vertical spacing being the lesser of either 16 times the um, diameter of the longitudinal bars or 48 times the diameter of the ties itself. So, there are very specific requirements that you can check as far as the spacing of the lateral ties or the least lateral dimension of the column and you are required to provide 135 degree hooks which are required to ensure that confinement is not lost to the core concrete before the yield capacity of the steel reinforcement is reached and this is a particular requirement for uh, seismic resistance of masonry masonry and reinforced concrete constructions. When you are looking at walls or beams which are subjected to uh, shear, it is required that the reinforced masonry, the, the reinforcement uh, be considered um, when you are designing for shear and uh, the minimum area of shear reinforcement in depending on the direction of loading. Uh, AV minimum is the shear force uh, into the spacing divided by FS which is the permissible um, stress in steel divided by the uh, distance between the extreme compression fiber to the centroid of the steel um, that you are placing. So, Vs by FSD is the minimum area of shear reinforcement that you should be providing and there is a spacing requirement as well. The maximum spacing of shear reinforcement is the lesser of half D or 1.2 meters and then depending on whether your, the wall is subjected to concentrated lo loads or uniformly distributed loads, the um, either the maximum shear demand at the point of um, concentrated loading or you can look at in the case of a, uh, a wall with UDL or a beam with UDL, the maximum shear at 0.5 D from the support phase, but as long as the support reaction causes compression in that zone and uh, if, if there is no localized compression providing the beneficial effect uh, of compression to shear, you cannot use this um, distance of 0.5 D for estimating the shear demand, you will have to look at the support phase itself. So, this distinction between uh, locations where you have concentrated loads versus those with UDL, but um, not taking the shear force at the support phase, but at 0.5 D from the support phase as long as uh, compression is uh, is available at the um, at the location where the shear force is being estimated. Okay. Again, uh, broadly we need to define the permissible compressive forces, the permissible um, shear stresses and the permissible uh, tensile stresses because that is again uh, what you are going to be uh, checking against. So, if you look at the permissible compressive force, you have two parts of this expression. Um, if you remember the expression for unreinforced masonry, we, we used three modification factors, the shape modification factor, the stress reduction factor and the area factor. We are not bringing in the area factor and the shape modification factor anymore because um, those are not going to be governing and are, are negligible in terms of their effect if any and therefore, we are only going to be looking at the uh, second order effects eccentricity ratio and the slenderness ratio. So, K s as earlier the stress reduction factor continues to be there in the uh, expression that is your shape reduction that is your slenderness um, stress reduction factor, but you have these two parts a part that uh, looks at the resistance uh, to compression or compressive forces coming from the uh, masonry. So, you have 0.25 which is a number that is coming back to us. If you remember the um, 
basic compressive stress was taken as uh, one quarter of the compressive strength of the masonry. So, we are limiting the um, stresses carried by the masonry to one quarter or lesser than the strength of um, masonry itself, compressive strength of masonry and A n is the net area that you consider. Uh, the second part of the expression brings in the permissible um, compressive force that the steel can take which is 0.65 FST is the permissible stress in uh, the steel, A s is the area of cross section of the steel itself. So, um, you will have to look at the, the same set of stress reduction factors that we used earlier for the uh, unreinforced masonry design. It is the same table where you look at the eccentricity ratio as estimated varying between no eccentricity to an eccentricity of one third or even one quarter, uh, one half and then different slenderness ratios going all the way from 6 to 27. So, this is something we have seen earlier and will help us estimate what is the uh, permissible compressive force for a given dimension and for a given combination of materials of the composite. So, you can look at depending on whether you have a, an ungrouted wall or a grouted wall or partially grouted wall, you are actually using the portion which is of um, masonry cross section unit plus the grout as being part which resists the compression. That is the left hand side that is one half of the expression and the other half is just the steel. So, you account for the presence of the grout when you are making this estimate. But the grout will have a different uh, compressive. The grout will have a different compressive stress. Uh, so, you depending on the material, depending on um, whether you are looking at uh, concrete grout in a unit, in a uh, concrete unit or a concrete grout sitting in a uh, clay brick unit, perforated clay brick unit, that distinction would have to be made in terms of the limiting compressive strengths. But uh, F m here is actually referring to the uh, strength of the masonry, strength of the masonry unit itself. So, the strength of the masonry unit will be either the lower of the two or the grout is at least equal to the masonry compressive strength. So, uh, if you remember one of the earlier requirements was that the grout material must have a strength at least equal to the uh, unit strength. So, from that perspective if you can make an estimate of net area depending on whether you have an ungrouted wall or a partially grouted wall or fully grouted wall, you are accounting for the part that is taking care of compression and the second part which is there for tension but is also contributing to the compression resistance. So, it is this a slightly conservative value? It, it is, it is conservative considering the fact that the grout and the uh, unit are required to have at least the same strength. In case you are looking at a combination of axial force and bending, then uh, you have you had the earlier possibility of an increase in the um, permissible compressive stress accounting for the strain gradient. You could, you could increase the permissible compressive stress for unreinforced masonry design by 25 percent and that is again uh, permitted in this design where if you have compressive stress due to a combination of axial force and uh, bending action then uh, you can increase the permissible stress and compression F A as 1.25 times F A, but if it is only due to uh, if there is no strain gradient it is F A. As far as permissible tensile stresses are concerned, it continues to be what we used for the unreinforced masonry code, uh, which is again if you remember varies between uh, 0.07 to 0.1 um, uh, MPA in the cross section. As far as permissible shear stresses are concerned, the code distinguishes between um, beams that you might be designing, reinforced beams that you might be designing and walls and again distinguishes the walls based on uh, whether you are looking at slender walls or squat walls and allows an estimate of the permissible shear stresses. Um, for flexural members, so if you are looking at um, out of plane bending of walls or if you are looking at beams, uh, reinforced beams, if you are placing web reinforcement or if you are not placing web reinforcement to take care of uh, 
shear, then the uh, limiting value of shear stresses are uh, prescribed, the one with uh, web shear reinforcement being higher, but uh, varies as a the value varies as the square root of the uh, compressive strength of masonry, which is which is how uh, the shear stress varies with the compressive the shear strength varies with the compressive strength of masonry itself. So you have limiting values on this up to 0.25 MPa without web shear reinforcement and up to 0.75 MPa of shear stress um, for uh, flexural members with sh web shear reinforcement. We will examine the, the basis behind the uh, expressions for the um, walls in, in a more detailed manner when we come to the design of the walls for uh, shear, but basically you estimate the uh, permissible stresses limited by a, a maximum value Fv for uh, your design where you are providing web shear reinforcement and um, require the web shear reinforcement um, to, be, to be resisting the shear forces coming onto the wall or without the web shear reinforcement. But then the, this is um, the classification is based on M by Vd ratio which is nothing but the aspect ratio of the wall H by L. So the aspect ratio of the wall less than 1 would mean we are looking at uh, squat walls and aspect ratio uh, greater than 1 would mean we are looking at, um, we're looking at uh, slender walls. And so depending on whether we are looking at squat walls or slender walls, the shear behavior starts dominating in a squat wall. And so the, the limits on the shear stress is based on consideration of the aspect ratio, you see that m by vd ratio comes into the, uh, comes into the expression and varies as the square root of the uh, compressive strength of masonry. Um, when you have um, walls where you are designing web shear, uh, web shear reinforcement and the aspect ratio is greater than 1, the maximum value of, um, the, maximum value of the permissible stress is uh, 0.125 square root of fm that is missed out at and limited by uh, 0.4 MPa. <coughs> so you have uh, greater than 1 situation as well. Okay. Uh, with that, so you have the definitions of the permissible compressive stresses, tensile stresses and shear stresses. But if you are looking at seismic design requirements, uh, we have seen this in, uh, in the beginning of the lecture uh, with respect to uh, this module. So I am just capping and uh, recapping and then giving you an idea of what these uh, detailing requirements uh, would be. So based on the performance level of the shear walls in the masonry structure, you, uh, you can designate walls as uh, meant to resist in plane shear and uh, detail the reinforcement, design and detail the reinforcement to different performance levels. So the different performance levels of the masonry shear walls that the uh, seismic design provisions of the reinforced masonry code considers are three different categories type A, type A, type B and type C and um, type A is what is referred to as unreinforced masonry but detailed with minimum steel. Okay? So it's, it is detailed unreinforced masonry. There is, it is no longer purely unreinforced masonry but the steel is not designed, it is merely uh, prescribed based on some minimum requirements and this is limited to zones 2 and zone uh, zone 2 and zone 3 and if you are using this if you are in this category of uh, shear wall then you can use an r factor of 2.5 whereas the next two categories b and c are the ones that are referred to as reinforced masonry which means you are actually designing the wall as a flexural wall or a shear wall and estimating how much of steel reinforcement has to be put in. While the first one type A wall will still have to be designed as per the requirements of IS 1905, you will check the shear stress requirement, the permissible shear stress, permissible compressive stress and permissible tensile stress and then provide the minimum reinforcement for it to qualify as a type A wall. Whereas type B and type C would have to be designed as per the requirements that you saw in the last few slides on uh, effective span and permissible shear stress, permissible compressive stress um, and then minimum reinforcement has to be taken care of. So it is designed and um, conforms to minimum requirements of reinforcement. Type B 
is referred to as an ordinary reinforced masonry. Type C with more minimum requirements of um, steel becomes a special reinforced masonry category with both these categories uh, uh, being uh, applicable to zones 4 and 5 with R factors 3 and R factor 4. So what are we talking of in terms of this minimum requirement? So uh, when we say reinforced masonry, it is the reinforced masonry design prescri prescriptions as in the national building code for type B and type C whereas for type A go back to uh, IS 1905 and the minimum requirement, minimum steel requirement is as prescribed. So there are critical zones in which reinforcement has to be provided and the critical zones in which steel has to be provided with respect to the vertical steel is um, on either sides of the opening. When you have openings, the, the sides of the opening is a critical zone. Similarly, uh, the edges, the ends of a wall where uh, you have boundary conditions, that is a location which is again referred to as a critical location. So vertical steel reinforcement has to be provided in those critical uh, locations and there is a minimum requirement of how much steel must be provided in those critical locations and it is prescribed to be at least 100 millimeter square in those, uh, in those uh, areas. Similarly, horizontal steel has to be provided um, in again critical locations typically where the wall interacts with uh, the floor slabs. So at the top and the bottom of the wall, um, a minimum requirement that you have a bond beam reinforcement. So you have the lintel band and the uh, roof band or the plinth band um, where the steel reinforcement is at least 100 millimeters square and the spacing between these is at least 3 meters uh, apart. So if you give 100 millimeter uh, bond beam reinforcement then the spacing is about 3 meters which means you must at least have a, if your interstory height is about 3 meters you must at least have a, uh, a roof band of, uh, and a plinth band. You are, you are allowed to give more uh, depending on the seismic design itself. And then these are the other critical locations, the edges of the uh, edges of the walls and the edges of the opening itself where uh, specific requirements have to be adhered to as far as how much steel at what distance are you giving from these important locations. So what the code uh, gives you an entire set of verbal requirements which is again reproduced here in this drawing for the different types of walls. So the first type, type A is referred to as a detailed URM shear wall. So the URM shear wall is coming from IS 1905 design but it is detailed as, uh, as per the requirements of the National Building Code. That is your type A wall. The min minimum requirement of vertical steel as we saw in the previous slide and maximum spacing between them in the critical locations which are corners of walls and 400 millimeters around the sides of the openings and at the ends of the walls 200 millimeters from the ends of the wall. Horizontal reinforcement again minimum what needs to be provided and at what spacing and also with respect to openings the steel reinforcement has to should not be terminated where the critical location is um, or the opening itself is ending but should be further extended into the masonry construction by at least 500 millimeters or 40 times the bar diameter around the opening. And, um, close to the roof or the floor, again that is a critical location where continuous horizontal steel has to be provided either in the form of a bond beam or in the form of steel reinforcement that runs in that location. So this set of specifications, these spe set of specifications have to be adhered to and would classify as the minimum reinforcement requirement uh, over and above the designed URM shear wall as per 1905. The other two categories, type B wall and type C wall. In type B wall, you are designing as per the requirements of the National Building Code and ensuring that over and above the steel that you are already designing as per the requirements of the code, you have complied with the minimum requirements that are stated earlier. Whereas in the specially uh, reinforced masonry walls, uh, type C walls, you again, you are designing them as per the requirements of the National Building Code, but there are minimum percentages of steel that are required. So the horizontal and vertical steel together, the sum of the reinforcement should at least be 0.2 percent of the gross cross-sectional area of the wall and the minimum reinforcement in each direction, 
So the minimum horizontal steel and the minimum vertical steel should be individually 0.07% of the gross cross sectional area. So when you come to the special reinforced masonry wall, uh, shear wall construction, you have, um, you will not use the minimum requirements that we have been using for type A and type B wall, but it is more in terms of specific percentages that you have to adhere to. Also the maximum spacing of horizontal and vertical reinforcement should be the lesser of either one third of the shear wall length or one third of the shear wall height or 1.2 meters, lesser of the three uh, values. And in terms of how much horizontal steel you are providing and how much vertical steel you are providing, typically your vertical steel will be more than the horizontal steel. The minimum cross sectional area of reinforcement in the vertical direction should be at least one third of the requirement uh, of the um, the shear reinforcement. So this, this link between the two is essential. If you remember one of our earlier slides in the introductory lecture, it is established that the vertical steel improves the effectiveness of the horizontal steel. So you, um, you can have bed joint reinforcement acting as shear reinforcement, but they cannot be uh, as effective as a construction where vertical steel is provided to account for uh, good anchorage of the uh, horizontal steel itself. So this broadly gives us the um, overview of the uh, entire set of recommendations as far as reinforced masonry design is concerned. Of course there are some more specifications which you can read but um, what I have discussed with you today are key aspects that we have to, we have to uh, remember within this course as well and we will start looking at uh, in plane flexural design. PM interactions and then the shear design of the wall uh, in the next two uh, lectures. So, 